Okay. All righty then. Okay, guys, how you doing? In Jesus' name, Yahovah, Father, Son, and Spirit. <clears throat> How's the sound, guys? <clears throat> la, 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 la. Figaro, Figaro, Figaro. Figaro, Figaro, Figaro. The sound's okay because I got the fan on because it's hot in this room. <clears throat> so we're going to wait, as usual, a few more minutes enough faces to show up. Hopefully the day will come by the grace of Jesus Christ. I get about a thousand people like David does. I'm hating on him. Figaro, Figaro. By the way, you see my beard is very bushy because I haven't trimmed it yet. I'm waiting to trim it uh, next week. Lord willing, next week, maybe Tuesday, I'm going to trim it because I'm off to L.A. So I want to trim it for L.A. You know what I'm saying? It's really white, man. I don't know. I want to be 47, if the Lord wills. <clears throat> 47 and September 14. Right. Don't kick who out. <clears throat> All right. Get a big... Pillar beard like the Syrian Kings? No, I don't think so. <clears throat> Man, Lord bless my voice, strengthen my voice. <clears throat> la 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 ha. Figaro, keep praying for me, man. I gotta get these muscles, man. I gotta get them back. It's hard I'm trying. You're gonna be 47 October 15. Choose Jesus. My question is, does your brain move? <laughs> Don't ask me these silly questions about flat earth and come on. Don't don't go there, man. Come on, man. Let's focus on the subject. <clears throat> Where's our friend Orbiter? Asher Omar. Hello, brethren. How are you? We're doing okay. And you see, I got my Bruce Lee shirt because you know I like Bruce Lee. Yep, 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 yep. Well, I hope I do. Okay, your shirt, yep. Here, I can do this still. When I used to be like 220 a muscle, I used to have huge pecs so I could do this. See that? That's my upper pec. Now, why are you hating, man? You can't do that. Don't hate. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Anyway. <clears throat> Is Orbiter here? Where's our bro, Orbiter? Is that here? Okay. Keep praying for me by the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ that this huge trial... That's impossible for me to get out, get out of. God can do the impossible, do a miracle, pray. He delivers me. I got 60 days, but God is good. Really? Yip Chun taught you, Lopez? Interesting. Because Bruce Lee went beyond Wing Chun because Wing Chun is limited, and he went beyond it. Interesting. And you know, Lopez, that some of those Wing Chun guys resented Bruce Lee, so I don't think Yip Chun would have had a very high opinion of Bruce Lee because they considered him a traitor. But that's okay. They're haters, Lopez. Remember, you know, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Man, where's my boy? Where's James Lawson, man? Where is he? It's okay, Lopez. Don't be a hater now. Remember, as a Christian who loves Jesus Christ, right, you got to speak the truth. They be hating Bruce, but Bruce is the man. You know that. Come on now. Just because you're a Wing Chun guy, you know, Bruce, pound for pound, was one of the best. And the Wing Chun dudes couldn't last with him. Come on now. We speak the truth, man. We're not committed to any tradition, even when it comes to martial arts. Okay. So how many years uh, have you studied with Yip Chun? <clears throat> We're going to begin in a minute. Yeah. Protestant haters coming in? No, no. Someone asked me if I'm a Syrian Orthodox. Let me tell you what I am. Okay, let me tell you what I am. I'm trying to be a biblicist as much as possible, meaning I want to follow the Bible as accurately as possible, and I know I don't do, do so perfectly. So my tradition is the Protestant <clears throat> evangelical tradition because I still affirm <clears throat> sola scriptura and sola fide, the two things that Orthodox, Roman Catholics, the Church of the East reject. So that's what I, that's what I believe. Oh, yeah, Steve, Steve Lee Swift. He's, he's from Chicago, guy. He used to have a school on Sheridan. 
right? Steve Lee Swift. Are you are you from Chicago too, bro? Yeah, the com the uh, the computer froze for a second. Oh yeah, Steve Lee Swift. Yeah, he was from Sheridan. So you must be a local. Are you still here locally? <clears throat> How you doing, Aramea Chaldean, Pablo, and everyone else? Okay. Interestingly, I had to block someone, an evangelical brother, because he was getting kind of animated, excited. And then I'm not going to mention the pastor's name, but a pastor, a local pastor that I've worked with, sent me a message on Facebook telling me, you know, he's got questions. And the way I answer those questions will determine whether he, he and his church can fellowship or support my ministry. Bad move. That's not how you approach me. So I told him, I don't want your support. Leave my Facebook page as this app. Folks, do me a favor. Don't approach me in this manner. If you want me to consider your position, let me repeat it again because I wasn't clear yesterday, I guess. <clears throat> if you want me to consider your position and hear you out, don't preach to me, don't proselytize me, and don't threaten me that you're not going to support me. Right. I don't want to be unnecessarily offensive, but obviously I'm not going to in any popularity contest because I'm <clears throat> a work in progress and I have issues impatience and anger. And I trust the Holy Spirit of God to transform me for the glory of Jesus Christ. And do me a favor. Do hit the like button because that sends a message to YouTube. Right. But anyway, like I said, and I said it yesterday, you can agree to disagree with me for my case. Take it, leave it. But. Don't tell me you're going to break fellowship with me or not support me. That doesn't bode well with me. Don't, don't do that because that's almost like an implicit threat. I don't care. I don't answer to you. You don't answer to me. We answer to Jesus Christ, right? And I need to say something about tithing soon. Anyway, before I begin and, and ask the Lord Jesus to bless and strengthen my voice, <clears throat> give me the health I need to glorify him and the anointing to bless you. Any questions? Philip, I don't really think I want to hear you out on ties. Really? I mean, you're trying to convince me again. Don't. Please. Do me a favor, brother. Don't. If you believe differently from me, then keep it between you and the Lord. Yeah. God bless you, Alpha and Omega. Okay. Really, I, I really, because let me tell you something. It's not because I think I know everything. May the Lord Jesus crucify my flesh, destroy my flesh, and keep me teachable. Just when people come and try to debate me and argue with me, that doesn't see. Uh, it, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, I don't listen that way. The way I listen, the way I listen, is I have to go <clears throat> and watch a video of a presentation or a debate or read an article without someone trying to shove it down my throat. And by the way, for the record, this position that I'm espousing took me about 20 years to arrive at. It's not because I'm the best debater of the monster. That's not it. I just don't like to be challenged. That's one of these sinful issues I struggle with, one of my imperfections and sins. When I'm challenged, I feel like I have to go into fight or flight mode. So that doesn't help me to listen to you. I don't like to be challenged. I don't like to be quote unquote bully. Maybe it's because as a child, maybe I was bullied, right? And I was a bully. And then I got put in my place. That doesn't work with me, honestly. And by the way, let me tell you something. I came to the position I'm articulating regarding communion saints. 20 years it took me to get to this position. 20 years of hearing the best that the Catholics and the Orthodox <clears throat> had to offer and the best of the Protestant side. And partly the reason why I even got involved and even became somewhat interested in this issue is because of James White and his debates with Catholics. Because when I first ran into James White, he was known for being the premier Protestant apologist debating Catholics. Believe it or not, it's his debates with Catholics that slowly moved me in a direction that I'm sure he's not pleased with because his intention in the debates was to get people to see his point in certain areas. I actually saw the opposite position the opposing view was much more solid than his. And I'm sure he's not going to be happy to hear that, but that's fine. Right. Uh, Esther in relief, my friend, don't be f afraid of me. I'm very easy to find. 
So is David Wood. But thank you. God bless you. I'm trying. I still got a ways to go. We're going to begin in a minute. Okay. Any questions before I begin? I didn't get to watch the presentation purgatory, but I've heard enough from all positions. Here, in fact, let me let me just confirm this. <clears throat> Are there Orthodox Christians here? I still have a way to go, Lopez, because I still got love handles, but we are going to flatten out by the grace of Jesus Christ. No, I can't stand baseball. Okay. Gabriel Fuda, you're, you're Orthodox. Yeah, I actually do a lot of cardio, and I do try to hit, hit the weights. Yes, unfortunately, he is. James White is. Okay, Gabriel, can you let me know? Do the Orthodox churches recognize purgatory? Do they believe purgatory is part of the apostolic tradition? Or is that unique to Catholicism? See, okay, that's the thing. So here's at least one belief unique to their own Catholics that the other traditions don't have, right? All right. Okay. Are we almost ready to begin? Okay, good. All right. See, that's the thing. If there's no pur purgatory in Eastern Orthodox then that can't possibly be an apostolic teaching. And I'm not saying if there's a teaching that the Orthodox and the Catholics hold in common, that's necessarily apostolic, meaning it comes from the apostles or the scriptures. Well, 2 Maccabees 12, 39 to 46 doesn't really prove purgatory. And I, I thank you for bringing it up because I will address that, Jesus willing, the Lord Jesus willing. <clears throat> in fact, let me just begin in prayer. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. We bless you. We praise you. We love you, Son of God. We love you, Lord Jesus. We praise you and we bless you as well. And we love you. We worship you, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Please, Holy Spirit, have your way with me. Have your way with this session. Cover us with the blood of Jesus Christ. Cover me with the blood of Jesus Christ. Please, Holy Spirit, fill my lungs and my throat my chest with life and health from your glorious presence. And fill us with wisdom and knowledge and power. And give us <clears throat> the grace to know the word to love the word, to live out the word, to proclaim the word and die for the word so to bring Jesus glory. Holy Spirit, it is your work to glorify Christ in and through us. Use me for that purpose. May I decrease and Jesus Christ increase and bless everyone to understand the things I say and give me the grace to crucify my flesh and prevent me from being unnecessarily offensive and not to tickle ears to speak truth and the clarity of thought and speech, and enable to recall these passages for the glory of Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit. We depend on you. We love you. Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. And Lord Jesus, cover us and our loved ones, my daughters, even their mother, by your precious blood. And <clears throat> save us from the attacks of the enemy. Please, Lord Jesus, arise for us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Amen. Yahweh, Father, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Father, Holy Spirit. Yahweh, Yahweh, Father, Holy Spirit. Yahweh, Father. I like that. Ely St. Charbel, that's a Lebanese saint, the Maronite Catholic Church, right? Okay. All right, now, a few, few things I want to say before I begin. Number one, just because someone does miracles, that doesn't make that person a true Christian, let alone a saint. I just want to be clear on this. Just because someone does miracles, that doesn't mean that person is a true Christian or a saint. Because the Holy Bible is quite clear. Satan will work through human instruments, empowering them with deceitful signs and wonders to give people the impression that they are Christians following Jesus. Okay? So the first thing I want to start with. Are you guys listening? Give me your undivided attention as I speak about the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> right? And focus and learn, please, for the glory of Christ. I want you to learn. The Bible is quite clear that there will be false teachers, false Christ, false prophets, false ministers who will do signs and wonders by the power of Satan. And in some cases, it won't even be by the power of Satan. It will be by the power of the name of Jesus Christ. But that still doesn't make that person a true Christian, let alone a saint. Let me prove that to you. Let's go to Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 and 23. Ask the Spirit to use me to teach you because he's the perfect teacher. I'm not. And to anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to your ears because I can't stand my voice or the way I look. 
I'll be honest. I don't know how you guys do it. That's the grace of the Spirit. <clears throat> and thank our brother Orbiter. Thank our brother Orbiter for serving me so I can serve you. Matthew 7, 21, 23. Thank you, Choose Jesus. Now, is that a sister saying I'm handsome or is that a brother? <laughs> Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. See, just because you say Lord doesn't mean you're a true Christian. You have to do the will of God as a sign, as an evidence that you belong to the Lord. Many will say to me, notice Matthew 7, 22. Many will say to me, in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name, see, in your name, by your authority, by your power, we proclaim the gospel. In your name, in your power, we cast out devils. And in thy name, done many wonderful works. But now notice verse 23. Notice verse 23. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. The word iniquity, guys, pay attention. Pay attention. The word iniquity in the Greek, and I'm not trying to impress you with Greek. I don't know Greek. Anomian, it means without law. Anomia, a negation, nomos, without law. These people did miracles in the name of Jesus because the name of Jesus is powerful, but they were still not true Christians because they failed to honor Christ by obeying his law. You catch it? Now, I'm not saying, I'm not of the tradition that believes that you do good works in a state of grace to be saved and merit eternal life. You're saved because of the perfect righteousness of Christ, which you receive as a gift by faith in him. But if you're truly saved, born of the spirit, then you'll be empowered to obey Christ and not live in sin, live lawlessly, right? Pablo, what does that got to do with the future? Obviously, these people were doing miracles in the past before the future. What does that got to do with anything, Pablo? Pablo, understand what you just told me. They're not doing miracles in the future. They were doing miracles in the past, and now as they stand before Christ in the future, they're going to say, your miracles prove nothing. Rick, contact me if you want in private. You can send me an email, s-a-m-s-h-m-n at yahoo.com, and I can tell you how to contribute to the ministry, s-a-m-s-h-m-n at yahoo.com. But what is Jesus saying? The miracles they did wasn't proof that they were true Christians. And Charles Dickens is already beating me to the punch. Judas went around and did miracles, cast out demons, raised the dead, and he was still not of Christ. Let's go to Matthew 10, verses 1 to 2. In fact, you know what? Matthew 10, verses 1 to 8. I am, brother. Don't worry, it's in relief. You're trying to give me relief, but I'm okay. Matthew 10, verses 1 to 8. Read with me. Matthew 10, verses 1 to 8. And guys... I need to raise up the support if I'm going to sustain myself for ministry and get married. No, just kidding. Anyway, Matthew 10, verses 1 to 8. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, notice he's giving this authority to 12 disciples. Judas is one of them. Pay attention. He gave them power, all 12, against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are these. The first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Okay? Now, let's read. Keep reading. Keep reading. <clears throat> Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, Labias, whose surname was Thaddeus, verse 4, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Did you catch it? Judas is one of the 12 that Jesus gave power to cast out demons. Now watch this, verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Now pay attention to 7 and 8, folks. Judas had the power to do this. As you go preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, so Judas could heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Judas could cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. So Judas had the power to raise the dead, heal blind, lepers, and cast out demons. And still he didn't belong to Jesus Christ. Everyone with me there? So just because someone does miracles doesn't mean he's a saint. Just because someone does miracles doesn't mean he's a true Christian. A true Christian is someone who knows the true God knows the true gospel, and desires to live in obedience to Jesus Christ. Do you with me there? 
Is that clear? Did I establish the point that someone who does miracles, because some tell me, some people tell me, well, there were modern saints, saints today who did miracles. Isn't that proof they're Christians? No. No. Just because someone does a miracle or does miracles doesn't mean he's a true Christian. Let me give an example without trying to be unnecessarily offensive. Unnecessarily offensive. Follow with me. The Catholic Church loves and honors Padre Pio. P uh, Pio. Sorry, I butchered the name. For the Orthodox Christians here, do you recognize Padre Pio? Do you recognize Padre Pio as a saint? Okay, did you catch that? You Roman Catholics who recognize Padre Pio as a saint, the Orthodox don't. What's my point? One man's saint is another, another man's layperson, so to speak. You get what I'm trying to say? In other words, for me to recognize Padre Pio as a saint, I would have to recognize that the Roman Catholic Church is a true church and everything it teaches is solid. You get my point? You understand what I'm getting at? And I'm not trying to attack. I'm just giving you a point. For me to recognize these saints that are unique to the Catholic Church means I have to believe that the Catholic Church is absolutely true. And I don't. I believe there's a lot of teachings in the church that's false, which is why I'm not Roman Catholic. If I'm wrong, may God correct me. Same thing with the Orthodox tradition. There are saints unique to the Orthodox Church that other traditions don't recognize. For me to recognize that saint of the Orthodox Church as a saint, which would, would mean I'd have to believe the Orthodox Church is the true church and everything it teaches is true. You, you get my point, right? But all traditions recognize Ignatius. All traditions recognize Athanasius. All traditions recognize Irenaeus. All traditions recognize Justin Martyr. But many of the traditions don't recognize Tertullian. And in the Eastern Church, the Orthodox, they don't recognize Augustine. Augustine, Right? Am I right? I hope I'm not putting words in your mouth. Am I right? The Eastern Orthodox or the Orthodox tradition. You don't recognize Augustine. Augustine, right? Sorry, I'm live, guys. Sorry. Yeah. You with me there? I just want to hear from the Orthodox. Okay. Now, all two traditions recognize John the Damascene, right? John of Damascus and John Chrysostom. Uh, love life. I really don't think much of it because I don't believe in the stigmata. You see, this is something you believe because you're a Catholic, and I'm not trying to attack you. You get my point? You believe it because you accept it as a sign from the Lord. I don't accept the stigmata. I may be wrong, and God for, forgive me and correct me if I am, but you see my point. You see you're just confirming my point. Stigmata is where you have a, a, a saintly person who starts bleeding in the places where Jesus was nailed, right? Like the signs of the cross. So the hands will start bleeding, and they, find, they feel the pain of Christ, the pain he experienced on the cross, right? In his hands, in his feet, the sight. Well, I guess, love life, you haven't pay, paid attention to what I just said. Jesus said there'll be bona fide miracles done by people, and that's no proof that they're a Christian. So I guess it fell on deaf ears, love life. Are you listening? So what it's thoroughly proven? That still doesn't mean that's of God or has God's approval. That doesn't convince me. Go back and read Matthew 7, 21, 23, and Matthew 10, verses 1, 8. Even Judas did bona fide miracles, raised the dead, cast out demons, and he really did it, and he was still of the devil. That's not an argument for your belief. You want me there? I guess, uh, guys, am I, make, am I clear? Because love life seems to not be getting it. I don't care if it was 120 years he bled. Okay, I just want to make sure everyone got it. Do you understand? The Bible says just because people do miracles and manifest signs and wonders doesn't mean they're Christian. Was that clear? I just want to make sure because this is where I have a problem with people who are so dogmatic in their belief that they're being blind to what I just said. Please don't be 
so dogmatic and hear the other side. Now, let me give you other verses where it says that false prophets, false Christ will do signs and wonders by the power of Satan that will be so convincing, so convincing that even the elect could be deceived if it were possible. Let me let me show you. Love life, you you know you're going to get banned in about a minute. Did you see what she just said or he said? But he has also many miracles of healing. Okay, love life, I just want to make sure you're listening to me. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Don't, don't block her. I just want to hear. Love life, did you just read with me Matthew 10 verses 1 to 8? Judas Iscariot healed people, cleansed lepers, raised the dead, cast out demons. Judas Iscariot. Are you listening? I just want to make sure she's listening or he's listening. Love life. Did you hear that or do I need to quote the verses again? <laughs> I don't know why the Lord called me to teach, honestly. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. I love you. We love you. I'm not a patient man, Lord. Why call me to teach, Lord? Why, <laughs> why couldn't I be an IT guy and make millions and live a comfortable life? Okay. Let's go to Matthew 24, 23 to 24. Philip Renee, are you asking sincerely or are you, you're joking with me? Just want to make sure. Are you asking sincerely or are you joking with me? Just want to know. I don't know. So I'll make sure. Okay. Because of John 6, 70 to 71 and John 17, 12. Judas belonged to the devil and he's the son of destruction. John 6, 70 to 71. John 6, 70 to 71. And John 17, verse 12. Let's read it. John 6, 70, 71. Isn't it ironic, basic? I have no patience, and I promise you, the Lord is my witness. I never planned to be a Bible teacher. I wanted to be a kickboxer, bodybuilder, and make it into Hollywood to be the first Assyrian superstar. Talk about God having a sense of humor. He makes me a teacher knowing I'm very impatient. John 6, 70 to 71. John 6, 70 to 71. I don't see verse 70, brother. No, honestly, I wanted to become an Assyrian superstar, make it to Hollywood. Not Bollywood, Hollywood. John 60, 70 to 71. Okay. Jesus said to them, have I not chosen you, the 12? And one of you is the devil. Have not I chosen you, 12? And one of you is the devil. Now, verse 71. Watch here. 71. One of you is the devil. One of you 12 is the devil. Okay. Verse 71. He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the 12. So Judas was a devil who belonged to Satan. John 17, verse 12. John 17, verse 12. So Philip Rene, do you see miracles doesn't prove you're a true Christian? John 17, verse 12. While I was with them, Jesus praying in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I've kept, and none of them is lost. I didn't lose anyone that you gave me, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Did you catch it? The son of perdition, the son of destruction, Judas, he is lost because he's not one of those you gave me to keep. Okay, Matthew 24, 23 to 24. Okay, watch here. Stephen Universe, pay attention to this. Matthew 24, 23 to 24. Yeah. Matthew 24, 23 to 24. Thank Orbiter for posting verses and helping us. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Pay attention, guys, read. Now read 24. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders. Insomuch, these signs and wonders are so powerful that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Thank God it's not possible. But you understand the implication of our Lord's words? These miracles will be so powerful and convincing that even the elect 
for a moment may be duped, but they'll come to their senses by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will say, hey, wake up. Don't let that deceive you. The miracle doesn't prove that person has God's approval. Guys, don't ask me who the elect are. Those are the ones born of the Spirit, set apart by the Spirit, united to Jesus Christ. Don't change the subject. Let's keep on the subject. The elect are the true believers, born of the Spirit, kept by the Spirit. Okay, everyone there? So what do we learn? Just because, now, for the record, I didn't say Padre Pio is not a saint or he's a false Christian. So don't accuse me of saying something I didn't say. What I'm saying is, I don't care if Padre Pio bled for 40 years. I don't care if he did 10,000 miracles. That's no proof he belongs to God because the Bible told me many will do miracles thinking they're Christian, but they're not. No, love life. I hope you are listening more than you're answering. Are you listening to the passages? Please, I don't want to cause you to stumble, but don't cause me to stumble. Right? Anyway, with that said, thank you, Nabil. Are we ready now to talk about communion saints? I just wanted to set this up, set the tone, right? Salam al-Masih. Alaykum. No, that's not proof either, Aramaic Chaldean Catholic Church. That's not proof either. Because believe it or not, you'll even find in other traditions that are not Christian where people's body have not decomposed. Okay, I just want to be clear. What was the point? The point is simply this. The point is simply this. Miracles do not prove you're truly a saint. Doesn't even prove that you're truly a Christian. It's what you believe, what you teach, and how you live. Just want to be clear on that. Is that clear? Now, I hope most of you listened to yesterday's program where I went into a plethora of passages showing those who are dead in Christ are alive in Christ and are alive, conscious, and God does make things on earth aware to them. That those in heaven are allowed to know of certain things that take place on I'm not saying everything, right? Not saying everything. But the notion that those in heaven do not know what take place on earth, that's unbiblical, right? That's unbiblical. I established that from yesterday, correct? I don't need to go over all those verses again. <clears throat> What's the question, Abiel? If it's related to topic, I'll tell you. What's the question? It's going too fast. I can't find it. Did you ask me the question? So you said I had a question. Okay. Now, are those dead in Christ, dead or alive? Okay, let's go to Luke 20, 37, 38. Luke 20, 37, 38, because we're going to establish a principle. We're going to establish a principle now. And I'm going to walk you through this, and I'm going to address some objections, Lord willing. Luke 20, 37, 38. I don't know how to do slow-mo. How do you do that? Luke 20, 37, 38. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he called the Lord, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, for he's not a God of the dead but of the living, for all live unto him. All live unto him. Did you catch it? Those who die in Christ, those who die in faithfulness to the Lord God are alive. And they are perfected, free of all sin, free of all <clears throat> disease, free of all distractions, free of all satanic attack and influence. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Let's look at another one. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. Now, guys, give me your undivided attention. Pay attention to Scripture. We want to be biblical. Hebrews 12, 22 to 24. But ye are come unto Mount Sion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Folks, don't miss it. He's talking about in heaven. Who's in heaven? Heavenly Jerusalem, not earthly Jerusalem. So who's there? 
an innumerable company of angels. So in heavenly Jerusalem, you have angels. But notice 23. The general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Wow. Who's in heaven with God, the Father? Who's in heaven with the angels? The spirits of human beings who are perfected forever in the presence of Christ. Now 24, read 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So again, who's in heaven according to Hebrews 12, 22, 24? Who's in heavenly Jerusalem? God the Father is there visibly. The angels are there. The Lord Jesus Christ is there. He presents his blood for our atonement. And who else? Let's read Hebrews 12, 23 one more time. So much for soul sleep. Hebrews 12, 23 one more time. Watch here. Hebrews 12, 23. And to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Did you catch it? They have church in heaven. You don't only have church on earth, you have church in heaven. And the firstborn is plural in the Greek. It means the church of the first who believed and were redeemed. The first believers who were united to Christ, they're having church in heaven. Church in heaven. But let's look at 23 again. And you're coming to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of men made perfect. Made perfect. Question. Let's look at Hebrews 12, 23 again. Orbiter, post it one more time. Question. I want you to look at it. So I'm going to repeat myself more than once. Why are these human beings, it says men, men meaning generally, humans in general, men, women, old, young. Why are their spirits there? Where are their bodies? Where are their bodies? It says their spirits. Their spirits are there. So why are they only there as spirits? What happened, folks? Give me the answer. In the ground, you got it. What does this prove? If you're a believer in Jesus... When you physically die, your spirit leaves your body, your body returns to dust, but you're still alive and conscious as a spirit being with a spiritual form by which people can recognize you, and you'll be in the presence of Jesus. Well, you see Jesus in his physical glorified body. You'll see the angels, Michael, Gabriel. You will see God the Father in visible glory, and you're going to join the church of the firstborn in heaven. Notice they are perfect, right? They are perfect. Even though positionally on earth, and you're, when you're in Christ on earth, positionally you, God reckons you as perfect, meeting the demands of law. But in your experience, experientially, we still struggle with sin. We still succumb to sin. We still have trials and tribulations that hinder us from being morally perfect. Yes, we'll get the bodies after Jesus returns. Okay. These spirits are perfect. They are free of sin, free of misery, free of satanic assault and temptation. They are perfect. Now, why am I emphasizing that? Proverbs 15, verse 8. Proverbs 15, verse 8. Now, Idiota Apologetics knows better to ask me a question not related to the topic. Spirit and soul, the same thing. Let's get off topic, Idiota. Proverbs 15, verse 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. Now, if you're upright and you pray, does that delight the heart of God? If you're upright and you pray, does that delight the heart of God? But if you're wicked and evil, does God accept anything you do? Prayer, sacrifices, no, right? So if you're righteous, God delights in the prayers of the righteous. Let's see how powerful the prayers of the righteous happen to be. James 5, James 5, 
13 to 18. James 5, 13 to 18. James 5, 13 to 18. Watch where I'm going with this. James 5, 13 to 18. Thank you, Billy. You got you know where I'm going with this. Read with me. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. See, if you're happy, sing songs thanking Jesus. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven. Now watch this. 16. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. Now watch this. Here's 16. Pay attention. That ye may be healed. The effectual, the effective, fervent, the efficacious, ongoing, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If you're righteous in the sight of God and you pray with passion and you pray fervently, right, ongoing, you will get results. And then it gives you an example. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, human like us, struggles with like us. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. By his prayer, it stopped raining for three and a half years. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Okay, did you guys catch this? Do you understand what you just read? If you are righteous, your prayers are powerful and get results. Can I ask you a question? How much more powerful would the prayers of glorified believers in heaven, free of sin, free of struggle, free of fleshly passions, how much more powerful would their prayers be? Okay. And I'm going to tie it in all together step by step. Just be patient with me, and we'll tie it in step by step. Let's see what the Bible says about praying for one another. Romans 15, 30 to 31. Nada, in comparison to people on earth who still struggle with sin, who still succumb to sin, who still struggle with satanic temptation and attacks. Those in heaven are free of all that. Romans 15, 30 to 31. Pay attention now. Now I beseech you, brethren. Paul, Paul is beseeching Christians. For the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. So he's commanding them. I'm commanding you, pray for me, that I may be deliver, delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my servants which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints. So here is a biblical precedence that we Christians must pray for each other. Pray for me. And actually, I need you to pray. 60 days. The satanic trial, only God can get me out of the satanic trial. Pray, because God will honor the prayers of you who are righteous, covered by the blood of Jesus, walking in the Spirit for me. 2 Corinthians 1, 10 to 11. 2 Corinthians 1, 10 to 11. BM, BM if you change the conversation, I'm going to ban you. 2 Corinthians 1, 10 to 11. Read with me. 2 Corinthians 1, 10 to 11. Who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will del yet deliver us. Ye also helping together by prayer for us. Did you catch it? We trust that God will deliver us, and you help with our deliverance by praying for us. That for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. Did you catch it? God will deliver us from these trials that look to be impossible. Please, my God, Father, Holy Spirit, do that for me. And you will help us in our deliverance by your prayers for us. Did you catch it? 2 Corinthians 1, 1 11. Renato, be patient, man. Be patient, dude. For the love of God, be patient. Ephesians 6, 18 to 19. Ephesians 6, 18 to 19. Ephesians 6, 18 to 19. Okay. Praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit. Paul is commanding the Christians, always pray and supplicate 
in union with the Spirit, asking the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, take over my prayer life and teach me how to pray. And watching thereunto with perseverance and supplication for all saints. So pray for all saints. Pray for the saints. The meaning believers on earth set apart. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. The mystery of the gospel. So here's another passage saying, pray for all the saints on earth. All these believers who set apart for Christ, pray and pray for me that a door will be open so I can proclaim the gospel boldly. So you got to be praying for these things, folks. Praying for your brothers and sisters and pray for my trial. I'm facing a humanly impossible situation. But our God does the impossible with ease. I'm still not done. Philippians 1.19. Paul is in prison. And Paul believes that he'll be set free from prison. Philippians 1.19. Man, I can't wait to trim my beard. Philippians 1.19. Watch here. Yes, pray for first and last in his condition. Pray. See, take these passages seriously. Look what Paul says. Read Philippians 1.19, guys. Read. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. You see what he said? I know I'll be saved from prison. I need that. Lord Jesus, I claim that message over my life. I know I'll be from my prison through your prayers. Your prayers will save me from prison. And the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ will supply my needs. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? Man, this medic is killing me. He said he failed one of his modules. He has to repeat it next year. Man, I wish I had your problem. And I was hoping you would pass your test and become a doctor and send me that money in 60 days. Oh, well, my prayers were ineffective for you. You got a hard life, medic. Anyway, did you see what Paul said? I know by your prayers, God will set me out of prison. Guys, take these passages to heart. God loves the prayers of the children of God who are covered by the blood of Jesus, born of the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. He loves your prayers, and he acts on your prayers and takes your prayers into consideration and does miracles because of your prayers. Believe. You with me there? You with me there or no? Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 3. Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 3. Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 3. I hope it's blessing you. You're learning. You're growing. Okay. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. With all praying also for us, see, pray for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, which I am also in bond. You see, pray for me in my ministry, and I'm asking for me. Folks, pray for my ministry. Pray God opens doors and protects me from this corrupt legal satanic system that wants to stop me from preaching. Pray against it. Pray. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 25. Continue steadfast in prayer, being watchful and in thanksgiving. Amen. Colossians 4, 2 to 3. Yeah. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5, 25. 1 Thessalonians 5, 25. Yeah, end fast for me, man. 60 days, guys. I may be out of ministry. Brethren, pray for us, short and sweet. 1 Thessalonians 5, 25. Brethren, pray for us, short and sweet. 2 Thessalonians 3, 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Amen. I need that blood of Jesus covering me and my daughters. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Love you guys too. Finally, brother, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course. You know what he's saying here? Pray that no one, nothing hinders us from preaching the gospel, but that we can preach it with freedom. Look what happened to our brother in Canada. 
He told homosexuals, Jesus love you. He went to prison. So Paul is saying, pray against that, that our freedoms won't be restricted so we can preach the word and be glorified even as it is with you. 2 Thessalonians 3 verse 1. Philemon, it's only one chapter. David Lynn, yes. Philemon, it's only one chapter, verse 22. Philemon 122. Philemon chapter 1, verse 22. It's only one chapter of 25 verses. And final one. And I'll tie it in. You're going to see where I'm going with this. But with withal, prepare me also lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. He's in prison now. Guys, you see what he said? By your prayers, God will set me free. God is going to wait for you to pray for my release. And when you pray, he's going to release me. Wow. Do you see how much glory and honor God is giving us that he's honoring his servants who are covered by the blood of Jesus, filled with the spirit, walking in the spirit, that he's honoring us by saying, pray and I'll act. Go ahead, pray and I will move. Pray and I'll do this. Don't think your prayers are meaningless. They're not. So let's look at Proverbs 15 verse 8 again. One more time to put it in perspective. Okay. Proverbs 15 verse 8 again. But if you believe, you better pray hard and fast for me for these next 60 days. Please. Please. For my dogs and I. If you want to get around, glorify Christ. Proverbs 15 8. Folks. Sweet. Okay. Sorry, man. Computer's freezing. That's the point. If the righteous... Please God when they pray, pray, and God loves the prayers of the righteous, those covered by the blood of Jesus, born of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, walking in you in the Spirit. Move when you pray. Okay. Hold on. I don't know. Is my connection okay? Hopefully. Before I'm, I'm just waiting. Yeah, I don't cheat. Running for the crown. Why would you mention my name, dude? Is it okay now? Why don't you just give them this uh, social security too? Unbelievable. Running, you want to give them my social security too? If I only know who you were so I can lay hands on you. Yeah, but when I lay hands on you, you're going to be even a bigger kicker name. Anyway, you know, now I say lay, I mean spiritually, right? I don't want the police to think I'm threatening you. Anyway, coming back here, coming back to the issue. All right. If it is pleasing and delightful to God for Christians on earth to pray for one another, and God wants you to pray for one another and be concerned with the plight of your brothers and sisters on earth, and he wants you to pray for them, and if we love our brothers and sisters, we'll pray for them. Do you think that changes once you go to heaven? And if the prayer of a righteous Christian on earth is effective, though he still struggles with sin, stumbles because of sin, and has problems and satanic assault that may hinder his prayers from being completely pleasing to God, how much more effective do you think the prayers of people in heaven are that they are free of all satanic temptation, attack, and sin. Do you with me there? I'm going to get there in a minute. I'm going to get there in a minute. The question, is it okay? I'm going to get there in a minute. Now, let's go to Revelation 6, 9 to 11. Now, it took me 20 years to come to this position, and a lot of Protestants got upset with me. I don't care. If this is what I believe the Bible teaches, I'm going to stick to the Bible, and I pray God gives me the boldness not to compromise, but to glorify Christ in truth and in the power of the Spirit. Galatians 6, 9 to 11. Galatians 6, 9 to 11. Read with me. Guys, read this, because I'm going to ask you something. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them... 
that were slain for the for the word of God and for the testament which they held. Now watch, these people are now slain. They're under the altar. Now notice what John didn't see. He didn't see their bodies, right? He saw their souls. Guys, why did he see their souls and not their bodies? Why did he see their souls in the altar in heaven, not their bodies? Thank you, because their bodies died. Their bodies in the grave, but their souls are still alive. But now second question, they were martyrs, right? They were killed. They were martyred for Jesus, right? Put Revelation 6, 9 one more time. Watch here. And when I when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them. The altar is in the temple, the heavenly temple. Can I ask you a question? Why are there souls at the altar? Why are they under the altar? Because the altar is the place where you offer sacrifice. Why are there souls under the altar? Can anyone tell me? You should remember because I mentioned this a while back. Yes, because they were an offering to God. By being killed as martyrs, they offered themselves as a sacrifice to God. And where do you present the pleasing sacrifices to God? At the altar. Wow. Wow. That's why he saw them under the altar. Because when they got, they died for Jesus, they were killed for Jesus, they sacrificed their life for Jesus, and Jesus accepts it as a pleasing sacrifice, delighting his heart. Right? Now let's go back and look at Revelation 6, 9 to 11. Revelation 6, 9 to 11. You see how much meat is in this word? Revelation 6, 9 to 11. Let's read it again. And when I when he opened the fifth, guys, read this because you got to follow me. Under the altar, the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. And for the testament which they held. <clears throat> and they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord? They're praying now, right? That's what we call prayer. They're crying out. How long, O Lord? Holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? So much for not praying for judgment on your enemies. No, brother, it's never biblical or right to pray that God will punish your enemies. They're praying in heaven. Now, remember, these are perfect Christians praying perfect prayers. And they're praying, God, destroy those who killed us. Avenge us. Oh, but I thought it's never right to pray judgment on those who persecute you. Really? Hmm. Okay, now let's read. Cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Now watch here. Verse 11. And what white robes were given unto them, every one of them. So they're dressed in white robes. And it was said unto them that they should rest. Rest. Enjoy my presence. Be filled with my love and peace. Rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be what? Should be what? <clears throat> Killed as they were should be fulfilled. Now let's put 11 one more time. 11 one more time. Revelation 6, 11. Revelation 6, 11. And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants, pay attention to this. This is the part I want you to catch. Also, and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Guys, are you telling me that Jesus told them that more people will be killed 
more people will be killed. There'll be more martyrs for Jesus. And there's a certain number of Christians will be killed before the end comes, before their blood will be avenged. So that Jesus told them what will take place on the earth. You're not the only ones to be killed. There'll be many others will be killed and a number of them will be killed on earth. So they know that Christians will continue to be killed on earth because Jesus told them directly. So the Lord made them aware of what will happen to Christians on earth. There's a number of other believers, your brothers and sisters, who also have to be killed. Once that number reaches its limit, then I will act and avenge you. And they knew that. So they knew as long as Jesus is in heaven, more Christians are getting killed on earth, right? Because when the full number is up, that's when Jesus comes down. Right? Am I making a correct inference? Question. Can I ask you a question? If on earth, imperfect Christians who walk imperfectly with the Spirit pray for the persecuted church, you're telling me these perfected, glorified believers, these souls and spirits who are now perfect and complete, being aware of the plight of Christians on earth, will stop praying for them? We'll stop praying for them. Answer me. So if you believe they'll continue to pray, then now you are admitting that glorified believers in heaven do pray and intercede for their brothers and sisters on earth. Wow. Hmm. Zina, you have to pray for non-believers to be saved, and God will honor that. Yes. Is that clear? You get it with me? You get it so far? Renato, I want to now destroy your objection. You don't think you can pray to him. Watch. Hold on. You're already assuming what you want to believe without hearing all the evidence. So please, if you made up your mind, don't waste my time and yours, okay? But I'll get there. Wait, guys, you already asked me, well, can you be patient? Let me, hold on, wait. I'll get to that and just be patient, man, okay? It's okay, Renato, you don't need to say because I've heard the object, just be patient. Okay, so far, you with me, right? Let's go to Hebrews 12.1, Hebrews 12.1. Hebrews 12.1. Let's read Hebrews 12.1. And then let me give you some of the exposition, the commentaries. Hebrews 12.1. Read this, guys. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed, surrounded about with so a great cloud of witnesses. Pay attention to our word witnesses. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Right? Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Let's put aside the sin and finish the race. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Paul takes the analogy from the Olympic Games in an amphitheater where you're running a track and you have spectators in the stands watching you. You understand the analogy? Let me repeat his analogy. He's taking this from the Olympic Games at that time where you'd run a track and you'd have spectators surrounding you and watching you run the race. You want me there? You understand what he just said? You understand what he's saying? You're running a track in front of spectators. They're watching you, Christians. They're watching you. So don't embarrass yourselves. By doing something to shame yourself in front of them. They're watching you and exhorting you, encouraging you to run and finish the race like they did. Now, let me give you some of the Protestant expositors. Here's the link. 
I can't post it all here. Marvin Vincent, Vince's Word Studies. I'm going to read it. Guys, pay attention. I gave you the link. Let me read his commentary. Pay attention because I can't quote, quote it all here. Witnesses, Marturun, does not mean spectators, but those who have borne witness to the truth as those enumerated in chapter 11. Even though he says doesn't mean spectators, pay attention though. Yet the idea of spectators is implied. Though he says it doesn't mean it, it's implied. And is really the principal idea. Okay? The writer's picture is that of an arena. Arena. In which the Christians whom he addresses are contending in a race. While the vast host of the heroes of faith. And who is he talking about? All the saints mentioned in Hebrews 11. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Samson, Jephthah, all of them, they're watching us because they already finished the race. They're in the stands watching you, encouraging you to finish. After having borne witness to the truth, have entered into their heavenly rests, watches the contest from the encircling tires of the arena, compassing and overhanging it like a cloud, filled with lively interest and sympathy, and lending heavenly aid. Wow. This is a Protestant commentator, folks. It's not He's not Catholic. How striking the contrast of this conception with that of Callback's familiar Battle of the Huns, in which the slain warriors are depicted rising from the field and renewing the fight in the upper air with the aggr aggravated, Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue, fury. Did you guys catch it? Did you see what this implied? All the saints of Hebrews 11, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they finished the race. They're now in the stands watching you exhorting you, encouraging you to finish and join them. Folks, you got problems. Hebrews 12, 11, 12 1 says, the host of heaven, the saints in heaven are watching you and praying you finish the race. Well, let me give you another Protestant. Here's another, and I'm, by the way, I'm a Protestant. So A.T. Robertson's, Robertson's word pictures in the New Testament. Here's the link. So you can go read for yourself. Here's the link. Read for yourself. Okay. Cloud of witnesses, martures, nef marturon. Old Latin, Latin nubis, nubis. Here only in the New Testament, for vast mass of clouds, tietai, nephila, is a single cloud. Watch here. The metaphor refers to the great amphitheater with the arena for the runners and the, the tires, the tears, upon tears of seats rising up like a cloud. The martyrs here are not mere spectators. They're not just spectators, but testifiers who testify from their own experience. Wow. It should be working, friend. You need to repent. Hold on. Yep, it works fine for me. Here it goes. It just works fine for me. There it goes. Click on it. Ray, you know I got to send you on your merry way, right? A.T. Robertson was one of the greatest scholars of the Greek New Testament, a devout Christian who worshipped the Trinity. And someone like you and nobody like you says he's a false teacher. You want me to stay on your merry way? Say it again. Attack these men of God and watch how long you last. Why would you attack these evangelical Trinitarian Christians who devoted themselves to know the scripture and affirm it? Why would you do that, man? Okay. Here's now Thayer's Greek lexicon and Strong's concordance. Let me give you the link. Here's the link so you can read it for yourself. Here it is. There you go, right there. Okay, let me read it. The word martyrs, right? What does it mean? One of the meanings is, in a historical sense, one who is a spectator of anything, of a contest. And then Thayer says, in an historical sense, and he quotes Acts 10.41, 1 Timothy 6.12, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Now watch the reference he gives. One who is a spectator of anything. Of a contest, Hebrews 12 1. He says the word martyrs here in Hebrews 12 1 means a spectator, one watching you.
treated. Whether you like it or not, you do pray to your brothers when you ask them to pray for you. If you define prayer as asking, when you ask me to pray, you're praying to me. So let's not get silly on the definition of prayer. I'll address it. Be patient. Okay, Ray, I love you. For the sake of the Lord, Lord bless you. No, Renato, I don't, I'm not interested in your question because you want to pontificate and not learn. Don't test me, brother. Even your comment is an insult. Sam, can we reason from? I'm not reasoning. I'm being stupid. Okay. Lena, was John omniscient? Okay, Renato. Bye bye, my friend. Adios, amigos. Hold on. Don't come back. Don't come back to the dreams that you live about. All right. Lena, Revelation 5.13. Revelation 5.13. Was John omniscient when he heard every creature worshiping God in the land? Revelation 5.13. Let's look at it. Revelation 5.13. Relation 5.13. I'm almost done. Ah, uh, well, yesterday was hard. Okay, Black Smurf. Thank you, bro. Let's read Relation 5.13. Lena, read. Read, guys. Please read. Read. John, he's before the throne of heaven, says, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, heard I saying. John hears every creature in creation, Lena. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne unto the Lamb forever and ever. Wow. Lena, not only did John hear every creature in all creation, he heard them in heaven, on earth, beneath the earth, in the sea, all of them in all creation, worshiping God and the Lamb. How was he able to hear all the various nations and languages on earth and understand what all these languages were saying, Lena? It's okay, basic. I'm going over it for her sake. Does that mean John was omniscient, omnipresent, because he heard every creature and all the different languages praising God and Lamb? No. No. You don't need to be omniscient. You need an omniscient, omnipresent God to remove the veil and bring creation before you. It's not that John is everywhere. God is making creation a present reality to John. He's bringing it before him and allowing him to see and hear the various languages in his language. So it is a canard, a smokescreen to say, you got to be omniscient. No, you don't. No, you don't. All you need is an omniscient God. Lena, does it matter whether it's a vision or not? So in a vision, I can hear everyone. What's wrong with you, Lena? My goodness, sister. All right. Notice the qualification. Oh, but in a vision, you can hear everyone. Come on, Lena. So then let me turn it against you. So the saints in heaven are given a vision of people on earth. There you go. See that, Lena? Let me now say. So now the saints of heaven are given a vision so they can hear your request. See? Come on, let's not argue this way. And I love you, sister. I'm not trying to be hard, but come on. So what is a vision? How does that make it any less real? You with me there? When I get loud, don't take, take it as me talking down to you. Just, you know. Everyone with me there? Luke 9. Luke 9, 28 to 32. Luke 9, 28 to 32. And by the way, I am not Roman Catholic. I'm not Orthodox. I believe in sola fide, sola scriptura. And I'll do a session on sola scriptura so that the Orthodox and the Catholics can attack me. I'm an equal opportunist defender. Right? But I don't accept everything in Protestantism. And I don't reject everything in Catholicism or Orthodoxy. I accept that which you can prove to me scripturally. And it took me 20 years to get to this position. 
okay? Read with me Luke 9, 28 to 32, guys. Read. Who appears? Who does God send to minister to Jesus and the disciples? Read. Luke 9, 28 to 32. And it came to pass about an eight days after these things, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain to pray. And he, as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistering. Watch here. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, hmm, who appeared in glory. Guys, pay attention to 31. And spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. 32. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with them. Guys, did you catch it? God sent the spirits of Moses and Elijah to speak to Jesus and tell Jesus about his future death. Folks, do you understand what you just read? God sent the spirits of prophets who had been dead to tell Jesus about the future. As if Jesus needed to be reminded that he was going to die in the future. This means, in principle, God can send the spirit of a loved one or a prophet or an apostle to speak to you in a dream or vision and make known to you a future event. This now opens the door for that being possible. If you're going to be faithful to the Bible. If the Bible informs your belief, this now establishes the principle that God not only sends angels, but he'll send the spirits of human servants to minister to you. Yes, he did as well, medic for Christ. 1 Samuel 28, 11, 19, the spirit of, Saul, uh, the spirit of Samuel was summoned. Listen, Paul, you don't need to go to seminary college. The highest education, GED, no college, no seminary. Holy Spirit trained. Trust the Holy Spirit of the living God. Zena, you'll know by the message they share. What was the message of Moses and Elijah? Confirmation of their prophecies in the Old Testament that Jesus would have to die. That's how you know. And they'll confess that Jesus is Lord. She asked me, how do I know if it's from God? What do they tell you? What message do they bring? Does it agree with the Bible or contradict the Bible? Basic, I just answered the question. Are you with me? How do I know it's a true spirit, not a lying spirit? What is the message? Do they confirm the Bible, agree with the Bible, or do they contradict it? This is not the only time. You don't need to quote it. Don't quote it. Write down 1 Samuel 28, 11, 19. God summoned the spirit of Samuel to rebuke Saul long after Samuel died. So don't tell me God doesn't do that. He did it in the Old Testament with prophets who weren't even in heaven yet with Jesus, but in the spirit realm called Abraham's bosom. Yeah, Gio, contact me, Sam, S-H-M-N at yahoo.com. Sam, S-H-M-N at yahoo.com because I can use your support for the glory of Christ. Priscilla, if you're a believer in Jesus and you die now, you go to be with Jesus in heaven where you see Jesus in his glorified physical body. You see the angels and you see God the Father visibly. Yep, medic, yep. Are you with me there? So far, yesterday and today, go back. Guys, listen to yesterday's session. Listen to today's session. And I think I made a comprehensive case. Angels, saints in heaven, believers in heaven are aware of things on earth. Angels mediate our prayers to God, bring our prayers to God. Angels intercede for believers on earth. I established that yesterday, Matthew 18, verse 10. Revelation 5, 8. Revelation 8, 2 to 5, and so on and so forth. I think I've made a comprehensive case. Glorified believers in heaven, angels in heaven are aware of things on earth and do pray and intercede for us. Now, here's the question that you all been waiting for me to answer. Okay. If that's the case, if they're aware of things on earth and they're alive and perfect and free of sin, so their prayers are perfect and get 
greater results. And they're right there before Christ. Can I ask them in heaven to pray for me while I'm on earth? You guys ready for that answer? Because that's what you've been waiting for, right? You've been waiting for that answer? Okay, you guys ready? Ready for the drum roll? Okay. Here's how I'm going to answer it. If you ask me, is there an explicit verse in the Bible where we find someone asking an angel or a believer in heaven to pray for him and her? You can't find it. So if you're asking me, can you show me that? No, I can't. But wait. Wait, hold on. If that's your way of trying to prove or disprove something, are you listening now? Let me repeat it again. I cannot show you a single place in the entire Bible where when someone is making a request to heaven, that he asks someone other than God to pray for him or to, to ask God to assist him. Right? However, however, is that conclusive proof that we should ask? Not necessarily. Here's why. Are you ready now? Are you ready now? Here's why that's not sufficient proof or disproof of the doctrine. No, it doesn't. Don't quote Psalm 148. It's going to embarrass you, destination. Because in Psalm 148, he's also praying to the sun and the moon and the stars. So are you going to now ask the sun to pray for you and the moon? Destination, don't go there, please. Don't embarrass yourself. Don't make your case weaker than it is. Okay? Follow me. Are you ready now? If you're asking me for something explicit, I can't. But everyone knows this to be true. There are times in which we arrive at doctrine, not because the Bible comes out and says something explicitly, but because when we look at the Bible as a whole and read what the Bible says in its totality on a given subject, we then arrive at conclusions and draw inferences from what the Bible teaches as a whole. So we don't just get doctrine from explicit statements. We also derive doctrine from what the Bible teaches as a whole and draw conclusions and inferences from what the Bible teaches as a whole, right? Right? And I'm going to give you a beautiful example. Are you ready? Are you ready? And you're going to agree and see my point. Show me a single verse that says, worship pray and glorify the holy spirit worship pray and glorify the holy spirit show me a verse that says pray to the holy spirit i can show you where it says pray to god the father pray to jesus christ i can show you where it says worship god the father worship jesus christ glorify god the father glorify jesus christ but can you show me anything explicit that says pray to the holy spirit worship the holy spirit glorify the holy spirit can you Aramaic Chaldean Catholic Church, that's in the afterlife, and they're in each other's presence. That's not going to help. Now, with, what, which one of you would say, therefore, I will not pray to the Holy Spirit. I will not glorify the Holy Spirit. I will not worship the Holy Spirit. If you did, you are a blasphemer. Because the Bible tells me the Holy Spirit is God, has all the essential attributes of God, is a divine person who's one with the Father and the Son, not in those exact words. And therefore, even though it doesn't tell me pray to the Holy Spirit, worship the Holy Spirit, glorify the Holy Spirit, I still pray to the Holy Spirit, glorify the Holy Spirit, worship the Holy Spirit because he's God. And the Bible tells me if he's God, then he's worthy of my praise. He's worthy of my worship. He's worthy of my glorification. You, with my, you see my point? Right? So I don't need it to be told explicitly. I look at what the Bible teaches about the Spirit as a whole, and I come to the conclusion He is God and therefore worthy of worship, glorification, and praise, honor. How does that tie in with the communion of saints? Well, let's make a case for that. If the Bible teaches that 
believers in heaven and angels are aware of what takes place on earth. And if the Bible says the righteous, their prayers are effective, and those in heaven are completely perfect, completely righteous, so their prayers are powerful. And if the Bible says that we are to pray for one another on earth and pray for those who are suffering because God will use our prayers to deliver them, then I can make the inference if they're aware of things on earth and they're still connected to believers on earth and they still love believers on earth because they love Christ and they love Christ's people, the church, and they're aware that Christians on earth are suffering, then I can make the case then they must be praying for believers on earth because they're still concerned for believers on earth and they still love their brothers on earth. Moreover, if the Bible says, I am to ask believers to pray for me, and I'm convinced that those in heaven are aware of my prayers on earth, then that means I can draw the inference, if they are aware in heaven of my plight on earth, then I can say, St. Paul, pray for me. That's how you make a case for the communion of saints. You with me, with me there? So I leave two things before you. If you want to say there's nothing explicit where someone asks a saint or angel heaven to pray, and therefore I won't ask, more power to you. Let me try it again. More power to you. But don't condemn those who, because of this cumulative case, who take what the Bible teaches as a whole, and connect all these dots and bring all these pieces of the puzzle together and draw the conclusion, I can ask Paul, I can ask Peter, I can ask the Blessed Mother of my Lord, Mary, to pray for me like I can ask you because I'm convinced they are aware of my plan on earth because God makes them aware. Don't you dare condemn them for doing so. Do you know when you condemn them? When they take the communist saints too far and give accolades or ascribe characteristics to these glorified believers and angels that should be given to God alone, when they cross the line, rebuke them for idolatry and tell them to repent. You with me there? I want to give you a minute for this to sink in. I'm almost done. I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet, but I want to take a minute to sink in. I don't want to B-Y-O-B, -B, sorry. Now, I know a lot of the Protestant brothers of mine are going to get upset. That's fine. Get upset, get upset, man. I'm not here to appease you. Another qualification I want to make. Uh, destination, it doesn't need to. Psalm 148, if you're going to be consistent destination. You quoted Psalm 103, right? Why don't you go to Psalm 148 where the psalmist also speaks to the sun and the stars and the moon and then argue that you can ask the sun and the moon to pray for you. See, you're being inconsistent. Don't make it harder for yourself. You with me there? When you say, did the Israelites ask the saints? Nothing explicit in their writings. Oh, thank you for mentioning it, Steve. Thank you. I almost forgot. Thank you. Let me give you an example, Stephen. Thank you. You're a godsend. I'm going to show you that the Jews were not shocked, right, at asking prophets to come to their aid. Thank you, man. Thank you, man. You are a godsend, Steve. Your answer to prayer because I was going to mention this passage. Let's go to Matthew 27, 46 to 49. Matthew 27, 46 to 49. Watch here, guys. Thank you, Stephen. Watch here. Now, that doesn't mean the Jews are right, but this answers your question, Stephen. They can be wrong. They can be wrong, but here, let me show you something. Matthew 27, 46, 49. Guys, pay attention here. Pay attention. And tomorrow, God willing, I'll show you a practice of the Jews in the Apocrypha that Catholics use 
but they're wrong. These Jews are wrong for doing it. I'll show you that. But read with me, guys. Read. Read. Matthew 27, 46 to 49. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now notice how the Jews understood him. Watch here. Some of them that stood there, when they heard that, said, This man calleth for Elias. What? He's calling Elijah. And straight away, one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, let, let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Bam! The Jews thought Jesus was calling the prophet Elijah to come to his aid. And now they're saying, let's see if Elijah will come and help him. Notice they were not scandalized at the notion of Jesus calling on a prophet who was dead. They just wanted to see if Elijah would hear him and come to his aid, vindicating Jesus that he wasn't a blasphemer. Did you catch it? That tells you that the Jews were not shocked that there were people who would call on the prophets, which means that this was something that must have been observed by some Jews. It doesn't need to be scripture for me to appeal to the apocrypha. And you believe it's Zutokanako, I believe it's apocryphal. So let's not get into that debate. Did you guys catch it? They thought he was calling on Elijah because in Hebrew, Eliyah, Eli, yeah, means my God is Yah. And they would call Elijah Eli for short. Eli. So when he said Eli, they thought he's calling on Elijah the prophet. Yeah, Elijah did die, Alpha and Omega. But he died in a unique manner in the sense that he didn't physically die and his spirit left his body. But when God transported him, his body was discarded and he entered God's, or I should say entered the netherworld as spirit. Yeah, Eli, right there. Thank you, Eli. So did you catch it? They thought, hey, he's calling on Elijah. Let's see if Elijah will hear him. So that answers the question. That gives an indication that there were some Jews, if not many Jews, who had no problem calling on the prophets to deliver them. Oh, and I forgot something else. Oh, man. See, hold on. I'm not done yet, man. Hold on. I'm not done yet. Let's go to Matthew 2. Again, the Jews. Yes, Stephen, they would call on prophets, and they would also call on call on the righteous. I stand corrected. Thank you. God sent you to remind me of this. I'm not done yet. Hold on. Let's go to Matthew 2. Let's read 17 to 18, or 16 to 18. Matthew 2, 16 to 18. Well, I mentioned yesterday, but I'm mentioning it today. Zina, that's Hebrews 11, 1 Corinthians. I don't have time to unpack it now, but read with me. Matthew 2, 16 to 18. Then Herod, when he saw, pay attention. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were at, in Bethlehem and all the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy, Jeremiah the prophet saying, Watch verse 18. In Rama was there a voice heard, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning. Rachel, the wife of Jacob, who had been dead for almost 2,000 years, weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. Now, guys, Rachel is the wife of Jacob. She had been dead for about 2,000 years when Herod slaughtered the children in Bethlehem to and under. Can I ask you a question? How could Rachel weep? about children being killed in Bethlehem where she was buried initially, if she wasn't aware, wasn't aware that the children were being killed. Did you see what it said? When Herod killed the children or when the Jews went into exile, Rachel wept for her children being persecuted. How could she weep if she's not aware of what's happening to them on earth? Mem, that doesn't answer the question. We know he's quoting scripture, saying that scripture was fulfilled when the Jews went into captivity and the children were killed in Bethlehem. She started weeping. So, Mem, how could she know 
that the children are being killed and weep over it if she's not aware about what takes place on earth. No, it's not, Fadi. It's not a figure of speech. I know you want to make it a figure of speech because you can't deal with the evidence. The answer is because who told you she wasn't aware? And now let me tell you what the Jews believed. You ready here? Let me read it to you. I was looking for the citations, but I got it. Here it goes. Genesis Rabbah, chapter 82, verse 10. It says, the reason that Jacob buried Rachel, right, in that particular spot in Bethlehem. Notice what it says. Guys, watch this. A Jewish source, Genesis Rabbah, 82, uh, 10. Jacob foresaw that the exiles would pass on from thence. Therefore, he buried her so that she might pray mercy for them. What? Genesis Rabbah, 82, 10. Jacob buried her in Bethlehem because, why? He buried her there so that she might pray mercy for them. That Rachel was buried in that, in that location so that when the Jews were taken exile, she would now pray, God have mercy on them. God have mercy on them. God have mercy on them. You with me there? This is a Jewish source. Okay. Another lamentation, uh, another rabbi. Pay attention to this. Lamentations rabbi 24. Lamentation, lamentations rabbi 24. When the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, it says that Abraham Moses went to God weeping, pleading for Israel, but God did not answer them. So here, these prophets of intercession was rejected. But now let me read it. Are you ready? You're ready now. Forthwith, the mercy of the Holy One, blessed be he, was stirred when he said, For your sake, Rachel, for your sake, Rachel, I will restore Israel to their place. Notice when Rachel interceded, Abraham interceded, he didn't answer. Moses interceded, he didn't answer. When Rachel interceded, interceded God said, For your sake, Rachel, I will restore Israel to their place. And so it is written. Now notice what they quote, what Matthew quoted. And so it is written, Thus says the Lord, A voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, Rachel weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are not. This is followed by, Thus says the Lord, Refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for your work shall be rewarded, and there is hope for your future, says the Lord, and your children shall return to their own border. What was that about it being figurative? Lamentations, Rabbah 24 quotes Jeremiah 31, 15. The same passage Matthew quotes to show Rachel wept for her children who went into exile and wept for the children who killed in Bethlehem, and according to the Jews, when Rachel wept, God heard her weeping and said, I'll have mercy on the exiles. Did you catch it? Jewish sources before and after the time of Christ believe that the prophets and the righteous did pray to God. And I showed you one from 2 Maccabees yesterday where Jeremiah is stretching out his hands and praying for Israel. You with me there? Now I'm going to end it with the icing on the cake, the early church. Lamentations Rabbah 24 and Genesis Rabbah 82.10. Lamentations Rabbah, it's a Jewish source. Okay. Section 24. Oops, 24, I'm sorry. And Genesis Rabbah 82.10. I'm almost done. Are you ready now for the final part? Early church fathers seeking the intercession of the mother of Jesus Christ, one of whom was Athanasius, the great Trinitarian apologist who exposed, refuted Arius at the Council of Nicaea. Are you ready? I'll give you the links that I can't quote right here. I mean, I can't post it here. You ready? A lot of meat today, huh? Okay. Let me give you the oldest extent prayer or request to Mary. It comes from Ryland's Papyrus number 470. Guys, pay attention. I'll give you the link to the site. Ryland's Papyrus 470. 
It's been dated to the year 250 AD, but there are others who say, no, it's in the third, fourth century. This, this papyrus comes from 300s, 400s. Others dated as early as 250 AD. Are you ready now? Are you listening? Or am I putting you to sleep? Are you bored? The oldest extent prayer seeking Mary's intercession. Are you ready? There's the link. Let me read it, folks. Let me read it. Okay. Beneath your compassion, we take refuge, O Mother of God. Do not despise our petitions in time of trouble, but res rescue us from dangers. Only pure, only blessed one. Wow. Let me read Athanasius. Are you ready? Athanasius, it becomes you to be mindful of us as you stand near him who granted you all graces, for you are the mother of God and our queen. What? Athanasius, you great defender of the Trinity, who silenced Arius at the Council of Nicaea, whom even Protestants like James White praise for your zeal for the Trinity. What are you saying, man? For you are the mother of God and our queen. Help us for the sake of the king. What are you doing, St. Athanasius? The Lord God, master, who was born of you. For this reason you are called full of grace. The prayer, the first one I cited, is dated around 250 AD, but others say 3rd, 4th century. I'm sorry, 3rd, 4th century is not... 300s, I'm sorry. 3rd, 4th century, 200s, 300s. 3rd, 4th century. Guys, Athanasius was one of the greatest defenders of the, of the church, a true servant of Jesus, a bishop, Alexandria of Egypt, who was run out of Egypt at least five times, opposed the Arian controversy, and he's asking the mother of Christ to pray for him. I got two others. But I think this will suffice for now, right? I don't need to go any... I think I've made my case. But let me now qualify it. So Mary is God. Only an ignoramus. Only someone stupid and a moron would call her God. My goodness. Hold on. Sorry about that. Now let me end it with a warning and a, cl a clarification. Okay? Okay. Number one, I am not saying you should pray to the saints and ask for their intercession. That's between you and God. Number two, not everything Catholics and Orthodox do, and not all the saints that they ask for their intercession, is necessarily correct. Necessarily correct. Why? Sometimes you do have people who go in excess. They go extreme in their veneration, and it borders on idolatry. They need to be warned. They need to, they need to be convicted. They need to repent. They need to be reined in because you can go excessive in your devotion where you ascribe to these creatures qualities that belong to God alone. Refrain from that. Repent of that. That's idolatry. Okay? With me there? With me there? Moreover, every tradition have their own saints that are not recognized by the others. So if someone says, should I ask believers in heaven to pray for me? Yes, I believe so. That's my position. Angels pray for me, yes. But does that mean everyone recognized as a saint is a saint? No. In other words, the Orthodox have their own saints not recognized by the Catholics. Catholics have their own saints like Padre Pio, not recognized by the Orthodox. Assyrians have saints, Mariosib. Marzaya for the Jilus, because I'm Jilu. Marzaya, not recognized by others. The fact that each tradition have their own saints, not recognized by all, means that you cannot know for certain that just because this person is recognized as a saint, that he or she is truly a saint in heaven. So what would I recommend for you who do believe that saints do pray and you can ask them? Stick with those that you know are in heaven. We know Paul is in heaven. We know Peter's in heaven. We know Moses is in heaven. We know Stephen is in heaven. We know the blessed mother of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in heaven. Those that we know are in heaven, if you want to ask, I see nothing unbiblical in asking. Nothing. 
You don't have to do it, but don't condemn those who do it. Is that clear? You become a saint by trusting in Jesus, being covered by his blood, born of his spirit, sealed by his spirit, united to him. That's how you become a true saint, set apart for the glory of Christ. Is that clear what I said? Now, again, please don't condemn me if you disagree with me. And I'm not saying you have to ask the intercession of saints in heaven. That's between you and God. But you no longer have any biblical reason for condemning someone that does. So if someone wants to ask the blessed mother of our Lord to pray, you have no biblical basis to stop them. It's your tradition that you're reading into the text. No more, no less. Is that clear? Yes, BMW. Is that clear? No, Stephen. You have no idea what you're talking about. You're a Johnny Gutton. Come lately. I'm going to ban you now. Because the Bible says they're not dead. They're alive. Luke 20, 38. They're alive. But you're another guy who loves your tradition more than the Bible. So I got to send you on your merry way. Hold on. Let me send Fadi on his merry way. Fadi, where are you? So I can say bye-bye to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, bye-bye. See, only someone who's an idiot and a moron who doesn't listen would use arguments that have been refuted. That means you're a joke. You don't care about the Bible. You care about your tradition. There you go. Anyway, I hope you're challenged. I hope you're blessed. Go back, listen to these two sessions. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahweh to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, we love you. Now, guys, if you understood anything tonight, this is what you understood. God loves the prayers of the righteous, covered by the blood of Jesus, born of the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, and will move and act and answer your prayers. That's why Paul says, pray that God releases to me from prison. If you're convinced that I'm a servant of Jesus, called to teach, then you need to pray and fast for me for the next 60 days for a miracle, that God will save me from this wicked, evil judge, this child of Satan, preserve me, provide for me financially and my children, and use me for the glory of Christ. So will you partner with me in praying for me and fasting with me? Nothing happens so I can continue to preach and teach and travel for the glory of Jesus? If you want to fast, I can't put a gun to your head. Right? It wouldn't hurt fasting. The apostles did. And pray for my angels that God will protect my daughters, convict their mother to repent of her sin and immorality. And pray for the provision. Partner with me financially due to work. And pray that God, in his good timing, will bring me a godly woman to partner with me. I have one in mind. Ask the Lord to make it known if that's the one. As long as you want. Next 60 days are crucial and vital. Anyway, see you tomorrow, God willing. Christ has died. Christ has risen. And he's alive. We'll come. Love you guys. Hope you're challenged. I'm going to get a lot of Protestants attacking me. So what? Let God be true and every man a liar. Jesus loves you and I love you too. But my love can't do anything for you. Jesus' love has done everything for you and will continue to do everything for you. We love you, Lord Jesus. Take care.